everybody, today we have our eighth lecture and I would like to explain you the details of the greenhouse effect. Already last time I explained you that the atmosphere is very important for the climate on a planet and I would like to explain you the effects now in more detail. So let's look at this diagram here. It shows you the sun shines onto the ground on the earth and it brings energy here. So the incoming solar radiation here is set to 100% and the incoming energy comes in the form of electromagnetic waves from the physics point of view. So it's light, it's visible light, but also infrared and ultraviolet light. This is converted into heat on the ground and therefore the earth is heating up. But not everything is converted to heat. Part of it is reflected, so there's about 6% reflection from the atmosphere. Then if there are clouds, in average there are 20% reflected from white clouds. And also the Earth reflects some of the light, especially the oceans. So what is remaining is about 51% and that is converted into heat. Then the warm Earth is from the physics point of view a black body radiator, so it's like everybody, it emits infrared light. The infrared light is emitted and goes out to the universe, so to outer space, and it cools down the Earth again. But the infrared radiation which is emitted does of course not all go out immediately because part of the infrared radiation is absorbed or scattered in the atmosphere. And this is the case because Part of the atmosphere consists of so-called greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases are gases which absorb infrared radiation. By this absorption then the gases become warm and then they become themselves a black body radiator. So they are warm and therefore they radiate infrared radiation itself themselves. But of course, this infrared radiation only partially goes out, part of it is reflected back. And that is finally the effect of the atmosphere, that the radiation which is emitted and is supposed to leave the Earth is scattered back by the atmosphere and warms up the Earth in addition. Then there are some more sophisticated effects. One is that if the Earth, the ground becomes warm, if there's a lake, for example, the water evaporates, the evaporated water then uh, takes energy with it because the evaporation process has so-called latent energy, as physicists call it, and when the vapor then condenses in the cloud to small droplets, this energy becomes free again, warms up the cloud, and this way the clouds become even warmer and start to radiate as well to the cosmos as down to the earth. Then of course the rain and the wind also transports energy that has also to be included in. and also the effect that for example the absorbed energy from the sun in the clouds and in the atmosphere is reabsorbed by different parts of the atmosphere. So in detail, it's quite complicated to get all those things quantitatively. For a better understanding, you can look at the following model. Imagine you have a bed and you are outside, for example, you are doing camping on the open air. And then during the day, you are very hot. All the solar radiation uh, heats you up and at night, your body is warmer than the outside and then you irradiate and you get colder. So if there's no atmosphere, uh, you have the effect like on the moon that during the day it's very hot and during the night it's very cold. Imagine now you have a sheet, a blanket, and you have maybe even several blankets, all kind of layers of blankets. So if each blanket, when the sun is shining, absorbs the heat and then it heats up the next blanket. So it takes a long time until you really get warm over the day. And at night, when the sun is gone, due to the blankets, 
your energy, your heat stays in your body and it takes a long time until the heat leaves you again. So in this sense, the different layers of the atmosphere and the clouds, they act as something which reduces heat on the day and increases heat at night. And the overall effect is that in average you are warmer than without the blankets or without the atmosphere. I assume you are not going to be in future a climate physicist or climate researcher who wants to do everything in detail and wants to understand everything in detail. Those people have to simulate all these individual processes quantitatively and in detail and that makes it very complex. But for you I have a simplified model and it's very useful to use that. This is a simplified simulation program of the greenhouse effect. It was made by the University of Colorado in Boulder. It's called Physics Simulation or PHET and um, this physics Simulation programs are very useful to understand physics, so you should have a look at the link and try all of them. But they don't only simulate simple physics, but also more complicated stuff like here, the greenhouse effect. And if you use this program, I just show you what comes out. It's very nice, so you have there the ground, and from above you can switch on the sun. The sun emits photons, these yellow dots here are supposed to be photons, so it's like energy packages which come from the sun. The more there are, the more solar radiation you have. And then the photons arrive on the ground and they are converted into heat. And sometimes the photons heat something up and the heated material and the heated atmosphere, or you can also switch on clouds, so the heated clouds they get warm and then they emit infrared radiation. And the infrared radiation are these red points here. And you see the yellow points come from the sun down. Sometimes they are reflected. And the red dots, uh, they are going anywhere. Some of them leave the earth, so they cool down the earth. Some of them are reflected back and they heat up the earth. So with this simulation, you can try to find out how the effects are. You have a way to measure the temperature here and you can change the CO2 contents of the atmosphere and the methane contents and the amount of water vapor and this way you can simulate different atmospheric conditions and each time you see what the greenhouse effect does and how the global warming works. Now let's have a look how it works quantitatively. You have to take into account that solar radiation has a complete spectrum of light, which means there are different colors. And this is shown in the next diagram here. The scale here is the following. You have the intensity of the light as a function of wavelengths. The solar light, the sunlight, is partially visible. And you know the visible light has different wavelengths. So the short wavelengths are blue, then it goes to green, yellow, orange and red. So the longest wavelength in the visible light is the red light. It goes up to 700 nanometer. The part of the spectrum which has larger wavelengths than this 700 or 800 nanometer, this is called infrared light and this is on the right side of the plot. The shorter wavelengths, which are not visible anymore, are called ultraviolet light. This is on the very left of the plot. The red line shows you the theoretical curve of the sun, which would be emitted according to uh, the so-called Planck's law. This is a basic physics law, which uh, you can derive from first principles. Here it's calculated for the temperature of the sun, which is 5525 Kelvin something like 5200 and something degrees of Celsius. Below the red line you see this red histogram. This shows you what actually arrives on the ground on the earth. So you see all the ultraviolet light on the left is cut away. This is due to the ozone layer which protects us from ultraviolet light. 
So nothing arrives on the ground, almost nothing. Then on the right side of this maximum you see some depletions. That is due to um, gases in the atmosphere which block some of the wavelengths. This is atomic physics which you can understand in detail if you want to. Now we go to the question what is emitted from the Earth due to the temperature of the Earth. There we come to the infrared light, that is the light with the long wavelengths, the one where we learned that you can see it with an infrared camera, like here this picture of the dog. There we see the blue line is the emission line calculated for the Earth as a black body radiator, so simply as a bowl without atmosphere. And the red histogram below again shows you what really is emitted. And there we see that there's much less emitted than without atmosphere. So this means that most of the spectrum is blocked by the atmosphere. There's only a small window which is allowed to be emitted. So that small window is there to reduce the temperature on Earth that it doesn't become too hot. So the gases which block, absorb or reflect the thermal radiation, they are called greenhouse gases and they have the effect that the Earth becomes warmer, that is the global warming or the greenhouse effect. How to understand these windows now and the effect of CO2? So we see here in this second plot the total emission and absorption of the atmosphere. And below we see the two main gases which are responsible for the greenhouse effect on our Earth, which is the water vapor and the CO2. So we see uh, that the water vapor has a very broad absorption band. So almost all the infrared radiation is absorbed by the water vapor except for this window of emission where our Earth is still able to emit something. Below you see the effect of CO2 and for CO2 you see that the effect of CO2 is much smaller and that there are only a few individual bands where the CO2 blocks the emission of radiation. You know there are quite a few, or uh, there are still a few uh, climate change deniers left on Earth and one of the reasons why they doubt about that is the following one. They say the effect of water vapor is so big and the effect of CO2 is so small and water there is everywhere on the planet, there are the big oceans, so there must be big effects from changes in the water vapor and only small effects from CO2, so why should CO2 be so important? Well, this is natural to think this way, but it's not completely correct and you have to look at the details to really understand it. The argument is the following. The absorption by the water vapor is basically saturated. So it basically everywhere absorbs already 100% of the infrared radiation. So if you change the water vapor, it doesn't make such a... So if you change the percentage of water vapor in the air, the effect is not so huge. I can show this in this small simulation here I did. So if I increase the water vapor by about a factor of 2, or decrease it just by rescaling this plot here, you see the effect is small because there anyway is an almost 100% absorption in all the bands except for the gaps in between and the gaps don't change so much. But if you now go to CO2 and I change the CO2, so I take it away or put it in, then you see there are two corners, especially the one in this window of emission, where the width of the window is changed. So this has a big effect, even if the concentration of CO2 is much smaller than a percent. You see, that is the reason why finally 
uh, the thing is so important. So you can look at it in another way. So imagine you have a big lake and there's a big barrier. So imagine this water barrier is the water vapor. If you make this barrier higher or not so high, it doesn't change the lake. If there's a gap in the center of the wall, in this barrier, where the water flows out, it doesn't matter how big the barrier is, as long as the window stays the same. Imagine now the CO2 would close slightly this gap in, the, in this barrier. Then closing the barrier would increase the level of the sea and open it would reduce it, independent of the height of this barrier. So this is an example for something similar, which has a similar effect as CO2 and water have on the atmospheric greenhouse effect. So for completeness, there you see also other gases which are important in the atmosphere. You have the oxygen and the ozone. There you see the main effect is that it completely blocks the hard ultraviolet light, which is very important on Earth. And then you have Rayleigh scattering, which is important for changing the color of the sky. So before we understand even more about the Earth system, I would like to come back to the planets. If you remember correctly, I did not talk about Venus yet. So Venus is very special. It's closer to the Sun than we are and it has a very high temperature. It has a temperature of 462 degrees Celsius, so it's much hotter than our Earth. In a way, we can maybe understand it because it's closer to the Sun, but let's do the math for it and really see if our formulas are working for Venus. So, here's the drawing. You see the distances of the Earth and of the Venus in comparison to the Sun. We know this 1 over R squared law, which tells us that if you are half as close to the Sun, you have four times the energy. Yeah? It goes with the square of the distance. So we can use this simple relations to calculate the intensity of solar radiation on Venus. On Earth we know we have 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. Now we have to scale that with the ratio of the distance of the two planets squared and inverse. So the intensity of the sunlight on the Venus is equal to the intensity of the sunlight on Earth multiplied with the ratio of the distances squared. So multiplied with 150 squared divided by 108 squared. And then you get 2.6 kilowatt per square meter. What does it mean? It means that on Venus you have about exactly twice as much solar radiation as on the Earth. So if you have a solar panel which brings 1.4 kilowatt on Earth, the same solar panel will have 2.6 kilowatts on the Venus. Now we use the formulas we used before on for the Earth. So we assume that the insulation by Sun is in an equilibrium with the emission by infrared radiation from the Venus. Then you get the same formula as for the Earth. You have to calculate the temperature as the fourth root out of this formula which we had. Then you have to remember that you have to convert from Kelvin to Celsius because in physics you have to give all the numbers in Kelvin. And in daily life you use Celsius, here, so you have to subtract 273 from the Kelvin number. If you do so, what is the result for the Earth as a black ball, we got plus 5 degrees Celsius as the average temperature. If we do that now for the Venus, we get 54 degrees Celsius. So it's significantly hotter what you expect because it's so close to the Sun. Of course, the Venus is not a black ball. It reflects light and it reflects more light than the Earth. So the so-called albedo, so the ratio of the reflected light to the absorbed, to the total one, is 0.7. So instead of the Earth reflecting 30%, the Venus reflects 70%.
If you take that into account and redo the calculation, for Earth we got minus 18 degrees Celsius, including reflections, and for Venus now we get minus 31 degrees Celsius. So the surprising result is that from our calculation, because of the high reflectivity of Venus, the temperature of Venus should be even smaller than the temperature of the Earth. We know we neglected the atmosphere, so with atmosphere we know Earth is warmer, instead of minus 18 it's plus 15, but for the Venus instead of minus 31, the real temperature is plus 462. So how can that be? Can this be understood by the atmosphere of the Venus? So let's look at the atmosphere. For the Earth, we know 99% of the atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen. That is two gases which have almost no uh, greenhouse effects. The big effects come from this 1% water vapor and this 0.04% of CO2. What about Venus? What you find out is Venus has a 96.5% CO2 atmosphere. So Venus has an atmosphere which is almost pure CO2. And you see what you get, you get really huge temperatures. So this is now reality, this is not simple calculations anymore. So please remember, CO2 is a greenhouse gas and in, on the Venus it seems to really have bad effect. It produces really a very hot atmosphere, this pure CO2 atmosphere. So let's really be careful when we increase CO2 on our Earth. Even this 0.04% might be already quite a lot for our Earth. So that should be enough for now. Thank you again for listening and next time we continue still with the greenhouse effect. And this time we come back to the feedback mechanisms of the greenhouse effect, which are very important for the understanding of global warming. Thank you and see you next time.